Thanks for coming. Thanks for being alums, supporting Rice. So the last time and the first time, uh, we had the first state of the school speech, March 22nd, 2012. So this is an update since March. And uh, I've learned a lot about Texas, Houston, Rice. And I've been out to Dallas and uh, Austin and uh, San Francisco. And it was a, I don't know, it wasn't an official club, but we, we've held events in Washington, D.C. as well. And uh, these, I can feel it. There's a lot more out there. That when, when Ted's talking about 10,000 uh, alums, that's, that's a lot of people. And uh, I can keep the ball rolling. This, this thing's good. So um, happy birthday. Uh, you know, that was the technology in 1938 when uh, Rice Engineering Alumni Association got started. Uh, I don't know whatever happened to Woofus. Uh, he may not be with us anymore. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, we had a celebration. We, it's over. <laughs> it took, <laughs> took a long time to get through that centennial. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from the president, and uh, these words uh, just play well with engineers. This is right up our alley, right down the heart of the plate. So uh, again, alums, uh, we had a centennial campaign that was a billion dollar campaign. For the School of Engineering, the goal was 115 million, and we came in uh, above the goal, 118 million and some pretty good change. Uh, and that's actually as of June, so maybe that number's a little bit north of 118, but it's a good number. And I thank you all for what you did for the campaign. And we're going to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where it came, uh, friends, foundations, <coughs> estates, corporations, and a pretty good chunk, a third of it, was from alums. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I thought I, you know, if, if you've gotten to know me, I'm pretty much put the cards on, on the table face up and, and talk about realities and what's good and what needs improving. So uh, 29 months on the job and we're making some progress. Uh, we'll show you some data on undergraduate enrollments and graduate student enrollments. All these things are going up. Uh, professional master students going up. Research is going up. We have a new department. Material Science and Nanoengineering. So Mechanical Engineering and Material Science, MEMS, is now Mechanical Engineering Department and Material Science and Nanoengineering Department. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's new, that just happened. Um, we're working a lot with School of Science and with School of Business, making good relationships with those folks, which obviously makes sense these days. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this Acronym SSPB, Synthetic, synthetic Systems and Physical Biology. And uh, OwlSpark, I'll mention that a little bit more. Uh, we're doing a lot more with industry, and that's good. You guys, many of you are from industry, and you're helping us with that. Rice Center for Engineering Leadership is reinvigorated. We've got a new executive director, and there's a certificate program, and more about that soon. Um, I don't know if you've been over to the design kitchen, but there now is a basement to the design kitchen, affectionately known as the kitchen sink. <laughs> and uh, it is now open. In fact, this is uh, Maria Odin cutting the ribbon. I'm looking in the wrong direction, and the president knows where the camera is. And uh, <laughs> So we had this uh, back in September, uh, and thank you very much for your donations to that. It was a $1.8 million addition to the design kitchen. and. Uh, very successful, and if you haven't been over there, get over there. Uh, so how are we doing? And, and these are some things. This is a slide that the president of Rice, President Lebron, showed this. And uh, depends on, on where you look. I mean, and Leiden ranking that's from Holland and the Max Planck Society, they, um, their metrics tend to be normalized, whereas other studies might be you know, who has the most research dollars? Well, if you're a really large university, you can be kind of mediocre at research, but if you're really large, it all adds up and you have a big number. So when normalized, Rice does very well. So here is, in this ranking, 2013, number one in natural sciences and engineering, and number six for all sciences. U.S. News and World Report, um, Rice continues to stay in the top 20, 
although we're now tied for 18. And once upon a time, I guess we were 13. And so 13 is a better number than 18. And when you're tied for 18, that means there's some not eight, you're almost 19 or 20. So, and once you get out of the top 20, nobody talks about you. So, you know, you could be 21st or 121st. And so we don't want to slip from 18. Uh, I want to reverse that. Max Planck Society thinks we're great in material science and chemistry, engineering, physics, astronomy, and computer science. That's all really good stuff. Um, now, <laughs> laying cards on the table, uh, Harvard getting back into the game. They're expanding in engineering. What is it here? They're going to hire 22 new faculty. Uh, Columbia, they got 14 faculty positions open, and these are new faculty, not just replacement faculty. Stanford, small school in the West Coast, they have built new buildings over the last 15 years for all of their nine engineering departments. So nobody at Stanford is in a building that's older than 15 years, and some are in buildings that just got completed. They now have a third of the students at Stanford are engineers. How many of the students, undergraduates at Rice, are engineers? About 34%. About a third. How many new buildings have we had? More about that later. <laughs> Notre Dame, Kansas, University of Rochester. Wow. You know? And what about Red Owl here in Texas? Uh, they want to go from about 12,000 engineers at Texas A&M to 25,000 engineers. And they're going to do it by 2025. So Kathy Banks, Kathleen Banks is the Dean of Engineering up there, and she talks about 25 by 25. So 25K of students by 2025. That's a tall order. That's a lot of new faculty, a lot of new buildings, dormitories, the whole thing. University of Houston, they're hiring 20, or they're replacing 20 faculty, and they're hiring 30 new, and they're building a 120,000 square foot multidisciplinary research and engineering building. Texas Tech, $22 million petroleum engineering building going up. I gave a talk. Boy, Texas Tech, I got, got to tell you some Texas jokes here. So they, it's flat up there if you haven't been to Lubbock. <laughs> and how flat is it? Well, I think they said it was 18 inches differential over the whole city, which is like 40 square miles. And then the joke is, when a dog runs away in Lubbock, you can watch him run away for a week. <laughs> and if you stand on a can of beer, you can watch him run away for a month. <laughs> all right, that's, that's my Texas joke, okay. All right, this is an interesting plot. I'm all about measuring things, and, and this is faculty in blue, so read blue this way. And students, red and green over here, the red ones are graduate students, the green ones are undergraduates, and you see the scale is different. This is, you know, only goes 140, this is a factor of 10 higher. So here's engineering over here. We have a little less than 120 faculty. We have about 700 graduate students. We have about 1,300 or so uh, undergraduate students. And then you can ignore these guys, and humanities has about the same number of faculty and a lot less bodies. Social science is there, music. Natural science is about the same size, but not so many graduate students and not as many undergraduates. So who's the big dog? We are, okay? Now we can go look within uh, the departments. I, I put this one up here because I'm concerned about this. Uh, red are males and blue are females. <laughs> And this is not a large number. Five, one, three, two, two, three, three, three. So we've got to do better. We're doing better on the students, but on mentoring the students and examples, uh, we need to step it up. Uh, this is the uh, counts by department. So you take that big engineering thing and break it down into the the departments, at this stage we haven't, and this is 2012 numbers, and this is MEMS, so material science and, and mechanical are still one department on this plot. And you can kind of see where the faculty are. So ECE has the most faculty, computer science is second, BioE is over here, and then the red are the students over on this side, and uh, 
red are graduate students, green undergraduates. And you see some departments have a lot of undergraduates and not so many faculty. And some have a lot of faculty and not so many undergraduates. And when I show these things, it's good for the departments to know where they are so they can kind of think, oh, well, geez, maybe we got to step it up because we're just relaxing here thinking we're doing great. Uh, these are the leaders in the School of Engineering, very important people. So the new department, Material Science and Nanoengineering, is being led by a giant. And uh, he is a very prolific researcher. He also teaches a sophomore level course, uh, Introduction to Material Science, which has brought in a lot of interest in many new undergraduates. Walter Chapman is a new chair in Chemical and Biomolecular. Uh, Vivek Sakar is a new chair in Computer Science. Uh, Vivek's interesting because he had a career at IBM until eight years ago, and then he came to Rice. And David Scott had been chair in statistics a long time ago. Kathy Enzer stepped down, and Marina Venucci is the new chair. But Marina is on sabbatical. So David has come back to be interim chair until Marina comes off sabbatical. I now have an advisory board, and we're going to continue to add to it. And these are the names of the people. And if they're a grad, most of them are grads, although Steve Wallach and Mahesh Desai are not alums. But that's OK. They're good advisors. And we're going to probably add another three, five people on there to get, we got to, for example, there's no bioengineer up there. And they're very helpful to me because we're going to review the School of Engineering in a year. And uh, they've been helpful in reviewing some of the departments, and we're not finished with that process. So here's our vision. You know, every organization has a vision. We didn't have this chart back in March 2012. But it's real short, you know. What are you all about? World-class research, unsurpassed education, and global impact. Easy to say, but not maybe so easy to do. Uh, STEM. Now, everybody talks about STEM, but you got to get the E in STEM. That's a really important part of that work. <coughs> this is a great quote. You might want to remember this, and then sometime you're at a cocktail party, you tell people that Norm Augustine, CEO of Lockheed Martin, says, and this is just facts, if you go and you look at 8,000 eighth graders in any school system anywhere, you got probably about one potential future PhD in engineering. That's the funnel, 8,000 to one. Now, you got to do better than getting one out of 8,000. And one of the things that's happening across the country is the number of students that are in high school that are going to go on to college is starting to contract. Not in Texas, but Northeast and the West Coast, uh, population is changing. And so if we want to have a STEM workforce, we got to get much more efficient than one in 8,000. That's pretty bad, right? Uh, so School of Engineering, right now we have something like 116, uh, 1350 undergraduate students, which if you take Somebody should do it 1350 divided by 3,800. And that's better than a third. Right? You had 1,300 over 3,900 is a third. So this is more than a third of the undergraduates. 800 uh, graduate students in professional, engineer, uh, professional masters of engineering. Postdocs, technical visitors, research expenditures of 52 million. Rice claims 113 million in research. Uh, volume, but there's some pass-throughs, and it's a little over 100 million in expenditures. So we're over 50 percent of the total research budget of Rice. Uh, this is an interesting uh, way of showing the departments. Um, I've kind of gotten used to the fact that I'm, I'm over here, but actually there's a lot of strength in computation at Rice. Always has been, and uh, I'm getting very comfortable with the fact that we're really good on that side. And there's some departments that's just sort of span both sides. So uh, it's a good school. I like the balance. I mean, I'm looking at the team now and I'm seeing, you know, infielders and outfielders and pitchers and relievers. I haven't said Red Sox yet, though. <laughs> uh, we hired a bunch of new people and uh, one new associate professor and five assistant professors. You can see 
uh, which departments are uh, represented in their disciplines. We're getting very good people. These, these are hard hires because they've got options at really good other options at really, really good other places. Uh, but attracting them to Rice, mentoring them well, helping them succeed, to be permanent additions to the faculty, very important. In case you hadn't noticed, this is school, there's a map here. BRC is, I don't know, a couple miles somewhere down. And uh, BioE and a little bit of ECE. ECE started to get into neuroengineering. So just wireless in another way, right? <laughs> just figuring out how things are wired together inside the brain. Anyway, this is the footprint of the School of Engineering. And you can see, uh, I don't know, like for example, civil and environmental is there, 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 that's like five theirs. Now a lot of surface to volume ratio in this school of engineering. <laughs> One of the problems here is that you know every time somebody retires and you hire somebody, where are you going to put them? Well, someplace, you know, and, and it's not a global optimization, it's a local optimization. So I would posit that this is not the perfect layout for a school of engineering. Uh, I asked Bart Sinclair to go and do the history of when did we get space? So in 1912 we had that, and then we had this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And the red things is when we gave up space. So we actually uh, came out of Herman Brown Hall at some point. We got in there, and then we got out of there when, um, when other things were built. Duncan Hall, for example. Keck expansion. Uh, Biosciences Research Collaborator, a big chunk of space. but. You know, this is remember those numbers. University of Houston was building something 120,000 square feet. You see 120,000 square feet anywhere? That's up there someplace, right? And we're all excited about BRC. Well, BRC is a really big building, and we got almost 70,000 square feet in that really big building, right? And then we had to give up some square feet, and we just did the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen, double the size of the kitchen, and we added about 5,000 square feet, right? So reality here is that we don't have a lot of space. Okay, so getting better, you gotta know where you are, you gotta see where you're going. You wanna measure slopes and second derivatives, right? See if you're getting slowing down or speeding up. So uh, we're reviewing in the midst right now of reviewing all the School of Engineering departments. We've completed BioE, ECE, and Mechanical. Uh, Civil and Environmental, November 20th. Uh, Computer Science, January 30th, and I didn't have space for the others, but they're all gonna be done by the end of the spring term. And uh, they're being reviewed by what's called advancement committees, which is an emphasis on the word advancement. Right? We're not saying these are review committees to sort of shut down departments or beat them on the head. It's to advance them, to make them better, prove them. And uh, it's external people. They're good people, members of the academy, fellows at Microsoft, other deans and department chairs and stuff from our peers. Uh, their job is to Point out what's strong, point out what's not so strong, and give us suggestions about how to improve. Right? That's well, how you run your organization. In a couple of years, we're going to bring them back, and they're going to ask us. So we wrote a two or three page report. We told you what is good. We told you what isn't so good. What are you done about it? And I'm telling the departments that it's them and me, the provost, we better have responded to those comments. When they come back and see we ignored their comments, they won't ever come back again, right? So we're asking people to spend a day of their time, and we value their comments, and we're going to execute uh, what they recommend, or give them a damn good reason why we disagree with what they recommended and why we didn't do it. We're not going to ignore it. Okay, U.S. News and World Report, which has you know, made this amazing business of selling magazines to parents, and here's the numbers on the undergraduates. That's now number 18, it's no longer 17, we're tied for 18. Best we ever were was 19, 16 in 04 and in 13. Notice, oh, wait a minute, we are, we are in 17, I, I said that wrong. Vice is tied for 18, right? And I would just suggest that if you look at some of these numbers in here, um, the reason that Rice is tied for 18 is because Engineering is pretty goddamn good, pretty big part of rice. So, biomedical, uh, they're six, is the best they were. Right now, they're eight, slipped a little bit. Stanford, 
opened the bioengineering department a few years ago, and right in front of us. Environmentals, 13, but currently none of our other undergraduate programs are better than 25. And mechanical and materials have never been ranked undergraduate better than 25. So part of my strategy for separating those two out is to shine a spotlight on them because now there's like 10 mechanical engineering department professors, which is too small, and there's six material science department professors, which is too small. But 16 somehow was okay, and you don't need to grow that. But in fact, uh, there's a lot of students in mechanical engineering and not so many in material science as undergraduates, and just the opposite on the graduate side. Uh, so, this is kind of a summary. We have a large growth, uh, very popular, but that means large class sizes, labs are stressed. We're doing a lot with clubs and hands-on experiential learning, MOOCs, uh, school engineering, massively online open courses, uh, don't going very well. Computer science and ECE really doing well there. The design kitchen rocks. Uh, leadership with our cell is rocking along. Uh, always looking for internships with industry. You got. I'd like to have every rice engineer do at least one internship. And I'm trying to get graduate students to also think about doing internships. Uh, entrepreneurship. Launch and Al Spark, we'll talk more about them in a bit. So this is a chart that uh, President Lebron showed uh, in his State of the University address. If you go back here and, and look, uh, once upon a time, uh, engineering was below science and just above social sciences. And here we are to 2013, but engineering has been going up. And the dotted lines are when you subtract out the foreign student undergraduates. So uh, you can see there's a Small differences, a few foreign students that are taking humanities courses, but mostly they're in these social sciences, natural sciences, and engineering. Uh, so here's the percent increase based on 06. Wish my bank account was doing that. 76% rise since 06. And these are the, the departments, so in 2013, there's a bunch of undeclared engineers, and there's the bioes, and the chemicals, and the civils, and so on and so on. So you can see statistics has been really small, but recently starting to grow. MEMS is very big. Electrical used to be bigger than it is now, etc. So you show this to faculty, you show this to chairs, you show it to other deans. Useful stuff to know. Uh, here's not such good news. When you have lots and lots of students, uh, you have classes with over um, 100 students in blue. Remember the Rice student faculty ratio is, is 6, except when you take some engineering courses where it's 140 or something, right? So here in statistics says three classes that are all over 100. Mechan mechanical has one, but mechanical has, what, nine classes that are over 40. So this is a consequence of being popular. The numerator's growing like crazy, the student piece. The denominator, which is the faculty piece of it, is not growing much. So this is kind of uh, what students think are good. Uh, they like the student-faculty interaction. They like uh, high-paying internships. Yeah, not only internships, but high-paying <laughs> internships, right? Uh, and they're getting jobs really great places. I mean, vice students are, are uh, highly sought after. Uh, they complain that there may be not enough upper division electives, and part of that problem is if you teach in all these core courses to all these majors, and people who are taking, let's say, CAM courses or statistic courses who are science and business people and so forth, that are, they want to take those computational courses at Rice, we're teaching those folks. Uh, everybody seems to be interested in hands-on, practical stuff, and uh, what they'd like to have more of uh, also is more faculty engagement. Um, and I think that interprets is that the faculty have to care a bit more. So they like the interactions, but they want more of them. So uh, what are we going to do about future rice engineers? What do we want? So I have to talk to, uh, to the admissions office, and of course we want the brightest, right? But we want them to be not, you know, you're at Rice. 
this is an interesting blend of engineering, science, and everything else, including music and architecture. So take advantage of that. Be intellectually omnivorous and uh, be enthusiastic, entrepreneurial. And one of the things here is you gotta you gotta get stuff done. You gotta be persistent. Sleep is overrated. So I uh, developed this. This, I like this a lot, so because uh, it's mine, my idea. I thought, right, I'm talking about leadership and entrepreneurship and internships, and I somehow got the oh, those are ships, and I got this image of a ship called L ship in front, E ship and I ship, and those things sail kind of in a convoy. A lot of interactions between those ships, and these I think are what's happening in engineering. Why Stanford is growing in engineering? Why Rice is growing in engineering? Is because students want to come in and be involved in these activities. And engineering is like the easiest thing to do this stuff. Engineers, it's always in teams. And this is going to help us get better and better students and better and better faculty. And it's another reason why the internet is not going to take and close down rice. Because these things are a contact sport. you got to be with other people in the same place at the same time doing things with them. And you can't do it just by saying, oh, I'm going to watch some uh, video on the internet. So I'm always getting feedback, and I welcome you folks to send me emails or come up afterwards and talk. So what, do you, what does industry think about Rice Engineers? And I've been around 29 months, and I've heard this a lot, and they say, boy, your guys are smart. But it isn't enough to just be smart, to be successful you got to use these technical abilities with other people to get stuff done. And so effectiveness depends on, I'll read it out to you, character, motivation, determination, communication skills, teamwork, strategizing, taking responsibility, and get the job done no matter what. And we're trying to push that to our engineers, and they like it. And I think it's helping us recruit better people, faculty, and students to Rice, because this stuff matters, and they know it. And those internships that we want more of, you go to a company and you learn this stuff day one. If you can't do these things, doesn't matter how smart you are, you're not going to be effective. So this is when I talk to undergraduates or graduate students. I got my ships here sailing. And the things that are above the line, those three things, I would say Rice has always been doing these sorts of things. Certainly, it's an intense place. It's a rigorous place real strong in the fundamentals, and faculty-student interactions, that's why you come to Rice. But in addition, work in teams. That wasn't so much in the past emphasized. Uh, leadership and hands-on stuff. Not leadership just by listening to somebody talk about leadership, but by being on a team and going through leadership labs, hands-on kind of learning. Uh, competitions and collaborations. Uh, there's internships up there again. And being an innovator and a leader, not just somebody who gets a good salary, but maybe you end up in the, in the uh, boardroom. You, you have a vested interest in the company. You're not just pulling a salary, but you've got stock plan and so forth because you're a leader. And they want you to stay, and they, and they want to reward you appropriately. So uh, McKinsey came up with something called a T-shaped individual. A T has a vertical and a horizontal stroke. The vertical stroke is the subject matter expertise. You're deeply knowledgeable about some subject, sort of a, you know, a silo kind of thing. Real deep, limited in scope. Certainly, that's important, and I think Rice engineers are very smart in whatever discipline they're in. So that's the vertical stroke. We got that. The horizontal stroke is what you need to become an effective engineer. Besides the subject matter expertise, the vertical stroke, you need to be able to communicate, coordinate teams, advocate, and you go up and you've got to pitch your ideas to the boss, and you've got to do a better job than the other guys who want the same resources that the boss has, and you've got to get them for your team. You've got to anticipate problems, plan ahead, and get stuff done. Right? You can't land the airplane some of the time. You don't get partial credit on a landing. You know, you kill everybody if you get partial credit. A bridge that goes three quarters of the way across the river is not a solution to the problem. On a homework, yeah, you get 75% credit, and you, you 
you're trying to optimize, but in the real world, you got to get stuff done. So Rice Center for Engineering Leadership. I don't know, is Kaz here? No? He's around, there's a lot of alumni around, but uh, we hired this fellow, Kaz Karwalski. He's the new executive director. Uh, he's been really, he's only been here since July, and he's making a big difference. One of the things he's introduced is a leadership certificate program. And that actually will end up showing up on their transcript if they complete the requirements for the certificate. It's a four-year curriculum which involves, besides courses, leadership labs where you lead teams and you take on challenges and you do stuff. And generally, we make you fail on purpose. So you learn, you learn from your experience. And then somebody else rotates on and they're the leader on a different activity and you're the follower and people are getting... Um, critiqued on their ability to lead, what they did, how decisive they were. They also do self-reflection. They keep a sort of a portfolio of their activities. These things are two-hour intensive things once a week. And uh, no excuses unless you're in the hospital. You can't cut class. Or you just drop out of this leadership program. Because one of the things leaders do is they take responsibility, they show up, and they get stuff done. And if you don't come to class, you didn't take responsibility, you didn't get anything done. So uh, talk a little bit about the Design Kitchen 2. You know, this is going to be like Super Bowl. We had an Austin Design Kitchen 1, now we have 2. Super Bowl 3 is coming, and check your, check your checking accounts. <laughs> so this was a 1.8 million. We got 6,000 square feet. We went from project tables of 34 to 60, so that's almost times 2. If you're a mechanical engineer, it's a factor of 2. Uh, we have NG120, which is one of the most impressive, and I really like the course, and so do a lot of freshmen. And we, and Bart was telling me parents complain when their kids can't get into NG120. NG They're like upset with Rice. I just sent my son there and my daughter, and he can't get into NG120. What's the matter with Rice? Well, we didn't used to have even any freshman engineering courses. Now we have expanded this by a factor of two, and uh, we now get the 160 through, but unless we have, you know, like only 160 students, we got maybe 300 students, so there's 140 of them that are unhappy with us. Good problem to have, though, right? And this year's seniors are the first class that started doing freshman design as freshmen, and now they're doing capstone design, and the instructors are blown away with the difference in quality of the projects. Because if you're a senior, and it's the first time you, you learn righty-tighty, lefty-loosey, it's kind of late in the game. But if you learn that in high school, or if it's freshman, if you've never done it, if you've never used a 3D printer until you're a senior, that's not good. You want to start playing with all these different tools as freshmen. And they do. And then by the time they're seniors, they're really working on some very, very interesting projects. And you guys fund some of these projects. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the projects are not four BIOEs working on a project. They're a bioe, a mechanical, electrical, and a computer scientist working on a project, which is more realistic, right? That's what happens in industry. So we got better projects, and they're all different projects. Every team is doing something different. It isn't like the answer's in the back of the book, and it's the same exercise that everybody's done for the last 19 years, and you can go into the archives and get the solution and turn it in and not work. Okay, now this is an attempt to see if we can get a video. I wanted to show you something. Hopefully the sound will work. I'm 17 and I'm from friends with Texas. MD has um, osteogenesis imperfecta type 3 and he it's a brittle bone disease, short. Um, and so his bones are very fragile and because of that he can't like lift heavy objects or even actually light objects. We take care of a lot of kids with a lot of very special needs here and it's one of the frustrating parts of, of our practice is that we see the needs that they have that we can't fill, that we can't meet for them. Things and, and sometimes it's the simplest thing. So, for example, D, he's got osteogenesis imperfecta, which is brittle bone disease. So the slightest touch and he'll break. He'll have multiple fractures. And you would think his main complaint would be that he hurts all the time or that the bones are deformed and misshapen, but they're not. His, his biggest desire in life was to be able to reach things, to reach the light switch in his own house so he didn't have to call his mom to turn his light on and off. And that bugs him. He's a teenager now. That bugs him. So it was really phenomenal to be able to work with these talented engineers. These Rice students were phenomenal. Put together a fantastic robotic arm for him to solve exactly his problem. And I didn't think it was going to be like that cool of a thing. 
I, I thought it would be cool, but then I saw it in July, and I was like, it was really, really cool. And so now that I get it this time, I can't wait. What the team has done has been quite remarkable. They started out with what was a class project for a one semester project and then persisted over a two year period to continue to work and to develop a project so that they could deliver it to their customer um, deep. This team has, again, without the motivation of grades per se, have really just taken a hold of this project, um, done an extraordinary job and, and finished the project in a way that very few student projects finish at Rice. exciting. He's learning how to do it and it's uh, neat to watch him be able to pick stuff up. And to see his independence, it's just really, um, it is exciting. I was just, it's been an incredible experience for us too. We never would have thought that we would be building a robotic arm for an actual patient. We would be helping people. Like when you come to college, it's not the first thing you think of. You're like, oh, I'm going to come to college and build something for someone. So. It's just been an incredible journey for us. Two years ago when we first started, I had absolutely no idea where this was going to go. In fact, I didn't even think that we were going to continue it. Um, at first it was just sort of like this project that I was working on, um, but slowly it developed into this um, personal investment. And this day is just amazing. It's, uh, it's the accumulation of all our hard work and um, everything since NG120 uh, to our undergrad research and uh, all the work that we've put into this project and it's just really great to see it all come together and Dee actually being able to use the arm. Um, especially since he's going to college next year. As a mom it makes me very excited for him to have that independence. Not to have to depend on me and his dad, you know, um, to do everything for him, you know. And, and I know, you know, he's supposed to be 18 and he that's, that's exciting. Every 18 year old wants that independence and He's just like all the rest of the 18 year olds. He wants his independence too, and this will get, that'll give him uh, the opportunity to go out and do more things on his own. Those kids are juniors here, and they're thinking of starting a company. And uh, uh, it's hard to talk when you see that. So that's a success. And uh, the Zion Kitchen rocks. But uh, with the enrollment pr pr uh, pressure, uh, those resources are now full. And you've got the open the kitchen sink, and the kitchen sink is full. And there's more kids that want to take NG120. And when they see that kind of stuff, they all want to do that. Right? And the, I can imagine if I am a parent, Got a kid that's at Rice, and come on, do what those kids do. You know, so we're looking for ideas and support, and you know, this is really, really good. So one of the things we have to do is, besides um, physical facilities, we need people. Uh, you saw Professor Ann Satterback; she's a professor of the practice or a professor in the practice. We we can have as many of those as we want. We don't have to ask permission. We just got to figure out how to pay for it. And uh, lecturers also are non-tenure track positions and we have more of those. Uh, the other thing we're talking about is limiting future engineering enrollments. I mean, growth is great, but if we can't adequately educate these folks, um, that's, there's no reason to bring them in and, and have so many that you can't do a good job with them. So we've been talking about uh, enrollment, looking to um, have less engineers or at least not continue to grow. And that's hard because, uh, as Bart points out, uh, once students are here, they can do whatever they want. And lots of them are going into engineering, even they didn't maybe check the box being an engineer when they, when they decided to enroll at Rice. Um, we're, I guess, victims of our own success. Uh, latest U.S. News World, I'm, I'm transitioning, I think this is graduates now, okay? So transition the second half of this thing, graduates. 
bio E, uh, in, in fact, you see a, a strong correlation between graduate and undergraduate. And, you know, these numbers are okay, not particularly great. Graduate engineering all overall, the undergrad was 17, we're 32 in graduate. So I see a need to emphasize more on the graduate side as well as the undergraduate. You need both. This is our research expenditures going up to 52 million. And the color code shows you, for example, BioE, very strong department. Uh, East in MEMS is here, uh, EC is green, very strong research volume. So I like the fact that's going up. I want that to continue. Now if you parse it down, and you, again, this is one of those things you show faculty, and if you're in, I don't know, uh, CAM, you might say, well, gee, that's not too much. But CAM doesn't have very many faculty. So what I should do, see Matias up there, is I should normalize by the number of faculty. And even then, if you're in computational things, if you use computers and stuff, you know, messing around with hoods and complicated equipment, then this is a pretty good number for uh, the number of faculty that they have. Uh, ECE is a very big faculty, and they're doing well. BioE is smaller than them, and they're doing better. So not this one is, you know, it's not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, you damn somebody because, you know, you only got this much money. But it's good to let people know what the competition's doing and to develop some sort of uh, friendly, well, these guys increased their budget by 25%, and we only, you know, we stayed constant. That's not a good thing, right? And so I'm trying to motivate people by showing them data. And, of course, what you want to do is see this as a function of time, and you want to see it uh, improve it. This is PhD students and, and master students, which kind of interesting here. This tells me, with, since research volume is going up and the student, graduate students are not going up very much, they're hiring postdocs. I guess that's OK. Uh, if you look at it in a long, longer time shot, from fall 2002 to fall 2013, there's been a 42% growth in graduate students. So here's PhD students in, in this mustard color, and it's gone, you know, you see the 42% right there, 1,000 to 4, 1,400. So a lot more PhD students, and that's due to the increased emphasis on research, right, which is one of those things that LeBron wants to have and we want to have. Uh, this is the ratio of undergrads, undergrads here, to grads. So grads were 35%, undergrads were 65%. You see the undergrads from 1998 to 2013, they added, right around in here, we decided to add 1,000, so we've gone up 1,000. And the graduate students have gone up from 1,400 to 2,600, so they're 1,200. Uh, professional masters, just a couple words on that. Um, very strong, in fact, let me show you the plot here. Uh, back in 9-10, academic year, 2009-2010, it was something like 40, 45 professional master students. Now we're up to 160. And you can see statistics has decided that professional masters report a program form. And they have quite a few. Uh, what's this one? This is ECE. So MEMS, for example, has not been paying much attention to or emphasizing or deciding for other, to do other things. Uh, Who's purple here? Chemical engineering, very little. And so uh, I like to show this to chairs and departments and say, you know, it's your choice. I'm not telling you what to do, but you can, you can see what goes on in the other departments. Uh, international students. Uh, Rice has a lot of people from China, and all the other countries pretty much stay the same. You know, if you look at the India, pretty much flat. Uh, Mexico, same, but the population of international graduate students from China and undergraduates from China are also have grown a lot. So what about graduate students? What are they like? Well, they certainly want to do research and win research awards. They actually like teaching undergraduates. That's, I, I get that feedback a lot. They like inter uh, my e-ship. They like to be on the ship. They want to do entrepreneurship. They want to file for patents. They are interested in startups. They get involved in this Owl Spark Accelerator. So e-ship and L-ship and internships, they're on the damn fleet, just like the undergraduates. 
and we need to do more uh, for graduate students on these internships. And also, <laughs> now, one of my best things I ever did, I think, I'll take credit for, is to get food trucks on campus. And this I heard from the undergraduates. So since August 2012, um, these various trucks come one only, and they don't stay very late, but that's better than having no food trucks. And uh, you know, if you're a hungry graduate student and it's late at night, uh, you want to be able to go buy a can of Red Bull, a Snickers bar, and a tuna fish sub. And then you're good for another four or five hours. And having, noticing that graduate students don't eat in the serveries and there's not a lot of options for food at night, uh, they pointed this out to me and, and I helped work with others and got the food trucks here. Uh, another program, just to mention, uh, SSPB, which is Synthetic Systems and Physical Biology. Uh, there's eight departments interested in this, so this is a new graduate program. It's not a new department. Uh, Michael Dean's the director. They have seven students that came in this fall. Uh, their undergraduate GPAs were 3.5, which is better than what the other departments were getting. If you look at some of these departments and say, what's the average GPA of your entering graduate students? It wasn't uh, well, right around here, but maybe slight, slightly lower, so they're attracting new students. And um, they've got courses they've been developing. And Dan Carson, Dean of Science, and Ned Thomas, Dean of Engineering, we both got together and said, we're going to support you guys for three years. And after three years, you're on your own. So we're going to give you nucleation funds. And if this works, good. And if it doesn't, it'll die. Because too many things kind of become entitlements at Rice. And if you have all your money invested in entitlements, you can't do anything new. So I uh, wanted to say a couple things about upcoming events. Uh, there's a material science and nanoengineering departmental kickoff, Monday, December 9th. It's from 2 to 6. Um, here's the, they have a website. If you want to figure out what's going on in that department, you can look at the new website. We're having an industry panel discussion. President Lebron is going to speak at this. In April, uh, there's a regional workshop on materials genome initiative, advanced manufacturing. The OSTP is the Office of Science and Technology Policy that's coming out of the White House. Uh, they would like to um, have the Southwest, and apparently Houston is the Southwest, uh, have a workshop, and we're going to do that April 28-29. And what they've got Materials Genome Initiatives in Biopharma and Nanotechnology of uh, you know, electronic circuits in Silicon Valley and so forth, what they'd like us to be thinking about, oddly enough, is energy. So that's uh, something you might want to keep in mind. Um, another thing, uh, there's a upcoming workshop, conference really, uh, in June uh, called Petrophase. And this is uh, Baker Hughes and Rice doing it together. I'm sort of showing you these things because I want you to see the School of Engineering is doing a lot of relevant stuff. So I wanted to leave you with some initiatives. Uh, Abercrombie on that plot, 1948. I was born in 47, so Abercrombie is just slightly younger than I am, and I ain't that young anymore. So uh, we want to spend some money to go and study. How can we better utilize the building? How can we renovate within the existing space? Because based on the future of building buildings at Rice, but it's not in the cards to build another building for probably five more years. And how do we get from where we are to when we can begin to even begin to build a building? Because oh, a new building for engineering might be as much as 10 years off. Unless, of course, we convince people that that's too long to wait. Super Bowl three. We need some more OEDK space. So I don't know what we're going to call it, OEDK three, the annex. I kind of like the idea of the innovation garage. But uh, we need some big space. These uh, tables that students work on aren't big enough for projects. I mean, if you're building a wheelchair arm, that doesn't fit on a small table. And if you're building a solar car, or if you're engineers without borders and you want to practice building a span of a bridge, you can't do it in the design kitchen. So, we're trying to get some space 
Uh, next to the design kitchen, I don't know if anybody here is from facilities or not, but I'm pushing a little bit to get some of those damn electric carts that are all parked out there out of the way, and we can put up a garage with overhead doors that we could have, you know, secure space inside with cages, air condition the thing, and uh, let big projects take place there. And this is all about hands-on learning. It's about leadership, teamwork, entrepreneurship, and so forth. Faculty lines. Got to help the denominator, right? You got to get some more faculty. So uh, as far as I can tell, nobody's going to hand me any lines. We got to go out there and raise money. And so right now we're in the midst of going after these three particular senior, uh, junior and senior chairs. Uh, they will not tell me not to go get money. Uh, they're happy when you raise the chair uh, money and endow the chair. Uh, so th this is the rationale for why these particular chairs need to, to be raised. And of course we need to replace people who are retiring and so on. But uh, I'm all about trying to create some new, new people, new slots. So path forward, uh, you can see uh, these are the topics that make great sense for Houston. Um, I mentioned that we're getting friendly with science and friendly with business to, to work with them on, on kind of cross-fertilization. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is measuring things, conduct reviews, take data, measure it as function of time, and the delta is always important to me. What's the difference between you know, the last year and this year and the year after and so forth? And how's that going to play out in 10 years? And if we had a vision for the school that we said we want to have, I don't know, so many engineers and so much graduate research and so many faculty and so forth, how the hell do we have the resources and infrastructure to be able to make sure that that works? Right now we're kind of out of kilter. We're overly popular and we haven't gotten rewarded with any space. Nobody's going to, in fact, nobody, reward, reward is the wrong word to use. Uh, Rice added a thousand undergraduates. Not all of them became engineers, but a lot. And we grew by 75%. Rice grew by 30%. Communities did not grow. <laughs> but I haven't seen any new money in our budget. There's, there's no correlation between what the students are doing and where the money's going. So we need to be advocates for ourselves. Um, we want to make you folks uh, proud of what we're doing, buy into it, care about the success. And we have to be able to show you that, that, that your help is, is in making a difference. Uh, and if we start centers, like I talked about SSPB, we're going to give them money for a little while. And God help them if they can flourish. And I hope they can. So uh, this is a major challenge. How do we get facilities and equipment? Engineering is getting more and more expensive to do with the clean rooms and microscopes and fancy pieces of equipment. Uh, research volume's going up, but you got to have stuff to do that research with. Even the uh, computer guys, they keep wanting bigger computers and faster computers and more of them and so forth. Uh, so um, these advisory boards, review boards, get outside people to come in, measure benchmarks, and then tell you how to get better. And then measure it again. In fact, I think telling, showing faculty plots and so forth in front of other faculty tells them that you're interested in this stuff, and they ought to be interested in it. And we talked about that, we talked about that, hands done, and so forth. Okay, so I think I'm almost done. So it's true, right? Engineers can help societies uh, solve some of the biggest challenges. And Bryce is really good in these things. This is true. Uh, and we're pretty collaborative. And if you want to have impact, it's not just ideas, and it's not just people, it's both. So we're trying to focus on key areas, can't do everything, we're not the University of Michigan. But we have to take some risks. <coughs> we want to do some new things, and want to get some visibility for it, because everybody else is growing, and they're you know, building buildings, and starting programs, and so forth. So if we just kind of keep status quo, we're going to get passed over. Uh, yeah, I want to inspire you guys. I hope you make a lot of money, and then you can write bigger checks. Thank you.